Um, so just a quick survey of hands here. Who in here has used an endoscope in the ear? Okay, good, no, good number of you. Um, and who here has used it to kind of just do an entire case with an endoscope? Okay, decent number of you, okay. All right, so you know, this first lecture really is to kind of just talk about middle ear anatomy with, via an endoscopic perspective. It honestly is the same anatomy that you would see through a microscope. Again, it's just through a different perspective. And so if we have time, I'll try to go through a few kind of tips and pearls on uh, using an endoscope for, for otologic surgery. Um, so really this lecture is more about endoscopic anat or just middle ear anatomy in general. And one of the, you know, when I initially started doing endoscopic surgery or ear surgery in 2014, um, I kind of did it coming into the course as a pessimist, essentially. I was like, well, what the heck can this add to my practice? And um, and then over a period of 48 hours, I realized that, hey, this this probably would have some, uh, this, would, this tool would be useful for a number of things that I do on a routine basis. And so, you know, again, we kind of, we all all traditionally have used the microscope to do ear surgery, and that certainly has a number of advantages. Um, but there are, again, always some areas of difficulty that we all encounter with the, with the microscope, and that's where I think, uh, again, the endoscope has a role in middle ear surgery. Um, so we'll start off with just the middle ear anatomy. These are all pictures and illustrations from Daniele Marchioni, who's an Italian uh, sur surgeon, and he and uh, Livio Prasuti were kind of uh, you know, one of the few, or one of the people who initiated using this technique. Uh, this technique's actually been around since the 1980s, but they really began to publish a lot of, uh, uh, publish a lot on this particular topic, especially with regards to Again, the endoscopic perspective on middle ear anatomy. So um, these illustrations are from his article. He's an amazing artist and an amazing surgeon. I can't even write my name out well. Um, so what this is demonstrating is, again, the mesotympanum. Um, so we have our hypotympanum, mesotympanum, protympanum, epitympanum, retrotympanum. And I'll, I'll briefly go through all those this morning. So as you can see here on the illustration, uh, you can see your, your stapes your tympanic facial nerve and lateral semicircular canal. So one of the unique things about that I didn't realize about the endoscope is that, uh, is that I always considered the lateral semicircular canal, at least you know most of the lateral semicircular canal, a mastoid structure. But in reality, when you, uh, if you look carefully, that the, the antebellated into the lateral semicircular canal is really in the epitympanum. And you can see that routinely if you look for it, but you know I just never really was looking at that for the, unless I was doing a, like a large atacotomy. And even then, I kind of still considered it a mastoid structure. But when you start doing endoscopic surgery, or, or when you, when you're, if you are using the endoscope, you'll notice that if you, you know, especially in cases where you have incus, uh, necrosis or the incus is, has been destroyed or the malus has been destroyed, the lateral canal is right there. And so it is really more of a middle ear or epitympanic structure. Uh, likewise, I always found the eustachian tube was a kind of a difficult structure to access, and again, that's more uh, a pro-tympanic structure, um, but in reality, you can see it quite well with the endoscope. Um, the mesotympanum, honestly, is really easily accessible or easily visualized with a, with a microscope or an endoscope. It's in line of, it's a line of sight structure that's then readily visualized. Um, the nice thing about the endoscope with uh, with regard to viewing the mesotympanum is that you can um, get a much more magnified view, but still keep a relatively large field of view while you're doing it. So if I want to look into the obturator frame, and I can actually do that with an, an angled telescope, either a 30 degree or a 45 degree, and look into that space quite easily, which is actually not as not certainly not as easy to do uh, with a microscope without actually removing some of the superstructure. Um, you, certainly if it's a stapes that's rotated inferiorly or superiorly, you may be able to see it, but certainly not as easily. Um, so going through that. So the epitympanum, um, we used to, I mean, at least for me, I, my routine kind of chronic ear surgery was patients would get a canal wall up mastoid, they get a facial recess, and then I would you know, reconstruct the tympanic membrane. And most of the time I was kind of just, any of these mucosal bands that we see around the malleus and incus, I was just kind of you know, going through without even realizing it. And, you know, these things are, are part of, uh, of middle ear chronic ear disease in that you have these two main ventilation pathways that connect your mesotympanum to the epitympanum. And that is the what's called the anterior isthmus and the posterior isthmus. And those are the two main ventilation pathways, or really two the only ventilation pathways from the meso to the epitympanum. So the anterior isthmus is the space, and this is a view from above, is the space between the tensor tendon and the, uh, the uh, 
incubus to pedial joint, essentially. And again, it allows ventilation from the middle ear to the epitempinum or vice versa. Um, the posterior um, isthmus is between essentially the, the facial recess and the, and the incus to pedial joint. Again, that is another ventilation pathway. And the rest of that opening into the, from the meso to epitempinum is covered by these, you know, lateral incomelular fold, the malleolar fold, and then something called the tensor fold. The tensor fold is a structure I'd never really even thought about before I started using the endoscope. And it's also a variable structure, not only in the orientation of it, but also whether it's a complete or incomplete fold. So if you look at cadaveric studies, a fair number of them will actually have an incomplete tensor fold, which means there's an opening in this fold, and that is another additional ventilation pathway. Or in the setting of chronic ear disease or an epitympanic disease, if they have a complete fold that may, and they have disease in both the anterior and posterior isthmus, that may be something too that you can potentially address to prevent recurrence in those locations. Um, but the tensor fold is a structure that originates from the tensor tendon goes along the semi-canal of the tensor tympani muscle and then comes out uh, essentially superiorly. Uh, and it's ver kind of variably oriented in that depending on how long, how large or small your anterior epitympanic recess is. And the anterior epitympanic recess is the space just anterior to your cog. So again, this is that tensor fold, and this is kind of that orientation I was talking about. So sometimes, if you have a very large anterior epitempanic recess, and this doesn't depict it as well, but the cog is actually right in anterior to the malleus, and if this anterior epitempanic recess is very large, your tensor fold is gonna be more horizontally oriented, and it'll be actually be easier to see. Um, if you have a very small anterior epitempanic recess, then that fold is gonna be oriented much more superiorly, and it will not be as easy to see. Um, and again, this is showing Prusak space. Again, these are all illustrations from Dr. Marchioni. And this space is, again, uh, ventilated by these anterior and posterior pouches of Entrolch. And this is kind of one of the things that you commonly see in clinic where they'll have a kind of a mild parse flaccid retraction. Uh, but again, um, those can be pretty mild. And one of the nice things about the endoscope is that you can use them in clinic and visualize these retraction pockets and determine the depth, what their depth is and whether it's something to be concerned about. Um, so again, we talked about posterior isthmus, and this is kind of just a direct lateral view, lateral to medial view, and that posterior isthmus is again between the incus and stapes and kind of the posterior anglus, and again, it's one of the main routes of ventilation from the epitympanum into the epi, uh, mesotympanum into the epitympanum and mastoid. Um, and then the anterior isthmus is a kind of a smaller pathway, and that is variable. We all have seen cases where your incus long process and your malleus are essentially right next to each other. And in that case, the, that ventilation pathway is just not as, as viable in some cases, especially in the setting of chronic inflammation. Um, so why are these ventilation pathways important? Well, if, if they're dysfunctional, as we see in chronic ear disease, then you can end up, you end up with something like this, where you have that classic crust in the pars flaccida region, and, and unless you remove that, you really won't be able to determine the extent of disease. Um, so again, and th this kind of goes back to that tensor fold, and again, whether it's horizontally or vertically oriented. In patients who have an, an open tensor fold, they're gonna have probably less ventilation issues and are less likely to have epitympanic disease. So this is just a quick video. This is showing kind of an anterior isthmus. So there's your incus long process, stapes, malleus. The drum has been partially removed from the malleus, and then there's some granulation tissue in that anterior, uh, anterior uh, tympanic isthmus right there. So I've already done a little bit of an atacotomy here. The, the quarter tympani has already been removed. And then you can see here there's some granulation tissue uh, and edematous mucosa, which kind of comes out of that space and uh, hopefully opens that up. So one thing I've always questioned, and again, I still haven't figured out the answer to this, is once you open these up, do they actually stay open long term? And I, I don't have a great answer for that because most of my cases where I'm doing uh, removing clusiotomas, I'm using cartilage. And you can still obviously get recurrences with cartilage, and we've all seen those cases where you have cartilage everywhere, and there's just that one little gap where the, the retraction, the, they get recurrent disease. Um, so pro tympanum, uh, these are, uh, again, more illustrations. This is out of an otolaryngology clinics article. And the various structures of the pro tympanum include the semi-canal for your tensor tympani muscle, what's called the, a space called the subtensor recess, which is going medial to the tensor tympani muscle. That's a variable space with various pneumatization patterns. It can be very, it can be essentially no space there. There can be kind of a space that goes up to kind of the midpoint of the tensor tympani muscle, and then it can go all the way up to the top of the tensor tympani muscle. 
uh, semi canal essentially. And those are cases if you have protein pain disease, those can be pretty challenging to uh, address that disease. Your petrous carotid artery, particularly the second uh, second genu and horizontal petrous carotid artery, are in the protempanum. And then you have this structure called the protoniculum, and that's a variably kind of um, a variable osseous structure that sticks off the carotid canal and essentially is kind of what separates the hypotympanum into the protympanum. Um, and again, it's just a way to kind of classify where extent of disease is and where it's located. And then there's something called the protympanic spine, which you'll sometimes see on the surface of the, the horizontal petrous carotid artery. So again, this is showing some of that anatomy in a cadaver. You have your tensor tympani muscle. Again, this is kind of the osseous eustachian tube. You have this subtensor recess, which is that space that goes medial to the semi-canal for the tensor tympani muscle. You have this protympanic spine, which is on top of the carotid artery. And there's that stu structure called the uh, protoniculum, which separates your hypotympanum from your protympanum. And this is the, uh, uh, the carotid cochlear interval. So your uh, cochlea is right here, your carotid artery is right here. And this is that subtensor recess, and you can classify it into kind of different types on depending on how deep that structure is, essentially. So if it's right up to the tensor muscle, it's type A. If it goes up to the midpoint of the tensor muscle, it's type B. And then if it goes above the level of the tensor muscle, it's type C. And again, I have not seen this a lot in my patients where patients have extensive disease in this area, but I've seen it certainly occasionally. Again, here's that structure, the protoniculum. That's a structure that's an osseous uh, kind of a spine, essentially, that separates the hypotympanum from the protympanum. And again, it can be variable, a variable structure. It can be just a single kind of bar of bone. It can have a bridge configuration where it ventilates uh, underneath or medial to it. And then it can just be absent, essentially. So retrotympanum, this is probably obviously the more, um, much more relevant area that we have to deal with on a routine basis. And I remember starting uh, as a resident and even early in my career and in fellowship, you know, uh, talking about the, the sinus tympani. And it was just one of those things that, yeah, you knew it was there. Yes, you were dissecting it blindly with angled instruments and you never really saw the boundaries or depth of it that easily unless you were doing a significant amount of bone removal or doing something like a retrofacial approach or something like that. And so I I always got the ponticulus and the subiculum confused uh, up until I started using the endoscope and I was able to see these structures routinely. So if you recall, so this is uh, again a, a, a left ear, your promontory is right here, round window niche is right here. You have the subiculum, which is an inferior bony structure that originates off the kind of posterior superior border of the round window niche. And then you have the ponticulus, which is arising from the promontory and going right up to the pyramidal process, which is cut off on this image, but that's where the pyramidal process is essentially. And those two structures are the superior and inferior boundaries of the sinus tympani, which goes variably medially to the, the tympanic facial nerve. And so this space, like any other space, has variations. And so you can have a very shallow sinus tympani, which if you have chronic ear disease, you love those situations because it's much easier to see and deal with it. Or you can have kind of a kind of a mid configuration where it goes up to the posterior board of the facial nerve, or you can have a real deep configuration where it goes all the way into the mastoid. And those are, you know, certainly more challenging. And, you know, fortunately, someone who has chronic ear disease and clusiotoma, a lot of the time they have more sclerotic, uh, uh, poorly um, pneumatized temporal bones. And so you know, the hope is that you don't see this as frequently, but we, we've all seen these cases where there's like an impossible to reach sinus tympani. And, and the nice thing about the endoscope, I think it's particularly useful in this particular area of middle ear surgery in that most of the time I can see the depth of this structure and I'm able to directly visualize the disease and remove it at the same time. The, the things that make that troublesome are is the way the patient's oriented on the table. If there's not a lot of good um, hemostasis, that becomes more challenging, right? Because all the blue blood is pulling right in that area where you don't want it. And so um, as we get in further into using endoscopes, we'll hopefully go through a few techniques on how to minimize that issue. So this is facial recess just from a, you know, on a left ear and I've done an atacotomy and essentially what I'm doing is elevating that clusiotoma matrix out of the facial recess. You can see the incus right, uh, long process and body is right here. And again, we've opened this up from lateral and it wasn't, a, it, even though this looks big, it's actually a relatively small opening into the lateral aspect of the facial recess. I'm unable to, I'm able to see this quite readily and dissect this disease out of that area relatively cleanly under direct visualization. So you can access the facial recess through the canal 
It does require some, some bone removal. I've done a little bit more removal here than actually back here, but it's again easily visible and removable. Bone removal off the cochlear promontory. Right. So yeah, this is posterior canal wall. Uh, and then this is, uh, this is facial nerve, incus, long process. Promontory is going to be over here. Cool. And then for sinus tympani, um, again, this has that configuration I mentioned. You have the type A, which really is flush to the facial nerve, essentially, and it's not a deep sinus tympani. You have the type B, which goes up to the, essentially, the posterior border of the facial nerve, and then type C goes well beyond. And these are relative, these are CT scans that kind of illustrate that quite nicely, that essentially the very shallow sinus tympani, kind of a moderate sinus or type B sinus tympani, and one that goes all the way back into the mastoid. And those are ones that, you know, you even though you may be able to see it with endoscope, it, the angle, the instrument angulation may not allow you to reach that that easily. And so that's where you potentially would just do that, have to open up the mastoid and approach it via a retrofacial um, uh, approach. And then there's another space called the subpyramidal middle space, which I kind of used to think of as a space that was essentially the same as the sinus tympani, but in reality it is a separate space. And what separates it is the ponticulus. That is the space that's just medial to the pyramidal process. And it also has kind of a variable uh, pattern of depth, essentially. It can go right up to the anterior portion of the pyramidal process where the tendon comes out. That's shallow. And then you have kind of more of a moderate one and one that goes fairly deep all the way to the facial nerve. And those that is separated from the sinus tympani via the pyramidal, via the ponticulus. Ponticulus also is a variable structure. It can be a solid bar of bone that has no communication between the subpyramidal space and the sinus tympani. It can have a bridge configuration, where, which is probably much more common from what, with what I've seen, where there is actually a pathway from the sinus tympani into that space and then therefore into the posterior oval window niche, um, or it can be just totally absent. That is the ponticulus. Um, the sinus subtympanicum is another space that's actually the space between what's called the uh, there's your subiculum and something called the, uh, the funiculus. The funiculus is a, another kind of structure like the protoniculum, like the ponticulus and, and the um, subiculum that basically separates the retrotympanum from the hypotympanum. And it's a variable structure. And you frequently will see Jacobson's nerve go through that structure up onto the promontory. And it, it's right next to the jugular bulb, essentially. And that's what separates this sinus subtympanicum from sinus tympani and hypotympanum. So the sinus subtympanicum is below the subiculum, medial to the facial nerve, and then it's superior to the uh, funiculus. And this is where you'll see your round window niche and what's called your infracochlear tract or subcochlear canaliculus. That's the little pneumatization tract that you can see all the way down to the petrous apex, depending on the patient's pneumatization. So Brandon, on that diagram, if you go back, mm -hmm. where would you expect the cochlear duct to be coming in? Anterior to the jugular bulb? The cochlear aqueduct? So it is going to be coming up. So this is a, a structure called, there's too many names here, but this is a structure called the fustus. It's like a dense otic capsule bone, and that's probably the lateral, kind of the lateral trajectory of where the cochlear aqueduct is going to come through. And then it's going to be coming kind of straight in towards you up into the medial wall of the uh, inferior, uh, inferior basal turn of the cochlea in the, in the scale of tympani. So it's going to be coming up into this structure. So I think that's really important because uh, that is exactly why basal turn ossification is the first place to ossify with meningitis, because that's the main communication between the CSF and the and a cochlea. And I had just had an experience where I was dissecting in there on a, on a glomus tumor case, and all of a sudden this fountain of CSF came out, and it can be really high volume or it can just be a potential space. But if, if you start getting a lot of CSF leakage there, you really have to very specifically block it. Right. And that you'll see that actually um, sometimes if you're doing an infracochlear approach for a petrous apex pathology like a cholesterol granuloma, that's, you have to be really careful about not getting into that. Otherwise, you're creating this gigantic opening in the apex, and then you've created this opening in the spinal fluid space, and that's just a, a mess to have to deal with. Um, the other thing that's important about it is the cochlear aqueduct um, there is a structure called the inferior cochlear vein which goes right next to it. And that is the main venous drainage pathway of the labyrinth and particularly of the cochlea. And so if you interrupt that structure and the closer you are to the cochlea and you interrupt that structure, the more likely you're gonna end up with a venous infarct and a dead ear. 
So, and again, I, you'll, you'll see that more on cases like, uh, you know, a paraganglioma or like a deeply invasive uh, cholesteatoma that's going into the petrous apex, you know, things like that. But in common chronic ear surgery, you fortunately don't encounter it that often. And, you know, we're going to have endoscopes for you to work with. And I think that where, where some people can get into problems, both with the hiss and facial nerve kind of medially in that sinus tympani area, hitting these veins, and you don't know why you get a dead ear on your chronic ear surgery. Oftentimes people take, you know, some form of mist or in a crab tree or whatever and just scoop in there. And right. hit it hard. If that's if that's eroded, you're scooping right through the pipeline that's keeping the cochlea alive, or you're potentially getting a CSF leak. So one of the things that we really want you to take away from today is you got to understand the anatomy you're dealing with. You also have to understand what's one millimeter on the other side of the fence, and a lot of skunks to be poked. So I think getting this getting this knowledge down is really beneficial. So this is just another anatomic view. Um, uh, in a left ear, you have your obviously your, your eye incubus joint. You have your anterior and posterior cruciate stapes. This is pyramidal process with uh, the, the uh, stapedius tendon, and this is your ponticulus in a bridge configuration. So it's a just a thin bar of bone, and there's actually communication medial to it from the subpyramidal space and sinus tympani. Subiculum is a little bit kind of more nondescript here, and this is that sinus subtympanic area between uh, underneath or inferior to the subiculum. This is just a quick video. Sorry, it's a little bit kind of uh, janky and moving around a little bit, a little Blair Rich effect. Um, this is showing a pretty extensive middle ear cholesteatoma. And again, I, I think I'm just I'm using a 30 degree scope here. And what I usually start with my cholesteatomas, particularly retraction pocket cholesteatomas, I will actually um, make my incision in the medial canal wall and. Uh, and basically, it'll be just lateral to the fibrous annulus, and I'll elevate that, I'll separate the ear canal skin from that fibrous annulus, and that will allow me to take the uh, matrix and dissect it out of the retrotympanum without interrupting it. So again, here is our pyramidal process, stapedius tendon. This is an angled instrument called a um, Thomason, and I'm peeling disease kind of underneath that subpyramidal space and out of the sinus tympani right there. And again, I'm not really looking into the sinus tympani as much, but I can see that there's a clear plane between that cholesteatoma matrix and the uh, sinus tympani. And what I kind of tell, you know, I are working with residents and fellows is that it's a mucosal dissection. And so ideally what you're doing is separating the mucosa from the actual matrix that's attached to the cholesteatoma from actually the middle ear mucosa, which is actually still on the sinus tympani and on the promontory. And basically what we're doing is just slowly separating those little mucosal bands that are there and those adhesions between the cholesteatoma mucosa and the mucosa that lines the middle ear space and love, elevate, able to elevate that out cleanly. And so I feel much better about this dissection, you know, than say if I, you know, uh, if I didn't have as good of a view of that. And so this, you can see how the endoscope help, would help in this situation. So just going through a few basics of endoscopic ear surgery, some intraoperative considerations, obviously anesthesia technique. You know, there's been a number of publications about this, but in general, uh, having patients on TIVA, which is total IV anesthesia using a fentanyl and propofol, is probably better for both uh, blood pressure control um, and just lack of uh, arousal during surgery. And so the inhaled anesthetics are a little less predictable, and um, and I've, they're sometimes associated with a little bit more uh, bleeding during the case. Light sort settings. So these light sources on the endoscopes can get really hot, and so it's really important that you lower the light settings. When you're doing sinus surgery, it's a much larger ventilated cavity, um, and you're much less likely to have a thermal injury. The middle ear space is much smaller than a sinus or a nasal cavity, and so and you're not irrigating as often typically during these cases. And so if you put the light source at 100%, you're definitely going to cause problems. The cord will dry up like a potato chip. You know, you can have thermal injury to the inner ear or the facial nerve. I've fortunately not seen that before, but I've definitely seen a few desiccated quarters. And so I normally don't set my light source higher. You, studies have shown basically between, you know, under 60% is probably safe. I have it up to, down to 20%. And there was one study out of Scotland that, from Arun Iyer basically showed that when you, he basically sent a whole bunch of endoscopic photos at various light settings that nobody really could tell a difference between 10% and 60%. It was essentially identical. So you can turn your light source all the way down to 10%. Again, you're much less likely to have a thermal injury and the visualization is essentially the same. Um, equipment. So there are some special instruments because you're one of the main disadvantages of endoscopic ear surgery is that you your left hand, which is your if you're right-handed, is your suction hand, is now your endoscope hand. And so you have fortunately within endoscopic ear surgery, there are some multi-tools that are available that can be pretty helpful. They're not they're not 
you know, required. Um, I, for the first few years that I was doing these cases, I was did not have those multi-tools or they weren't available yet, um, but they definitely make things much easier. And I'll, I'll hopefully go through a couple of those here in a minute. So um, room and patient setup, we'll go through that, patient positioning, can canal prep and injections, and then we'll go through a couple of flap incisions and, and how to do a tympanoid flap. So this is again showing the kind of primary advantage of the endoscope. Again, with the microscope, you're limited by line of sight. So if you have kind of irregularities in our ear canals, which we all have, that canal is kind of S-shaped, you're only going to see kind of what's directly in front of you and, and you know, from that, because of that. When the, with the endoscope, your camera and your light source are at the tip of the endoscope, and therefore, you get a wider field of view. So, what are the disadvantages of endoscopic ear surgery? Well, you lose depth perception and binocular vision, which is kind of a big deal, right? We're operating in three dimensions, and you lose that with the endoscope. There are is some... Uh, your brain does adjust to that like it does with sinus surgery, and you, you do get what's called parallax. The scope is always moving a little bit, and that gives you some sense of depth perception. So it's not, while it's not like 3D with a microscope, um, it, it, it's enough, and I feel, I, I feel like in my practice, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. The one-handed technique, which we've already mentioned, that makes things a little more difficult. Obviously, for training a lot of us who finished residency, you know, many years ago, uh, the only endoscopic experience I had was with the, with the nose, and when I started using this technique, it had been 10 years since I picked up an endoscope, but it really comes back to you. For those of you who are in training or just out of training, you guys are probably are, are well-versed in using, using the endoscope, and it actually doesn't take that long to pick up. Um, the other thing that's really annoying is the fogging, smearing of the endoscope. I mean, I know rhinology has some other things. They had this endo scrub thing where you could it would irrigate over the lens so it wouldn't fog up. With the ear, the, that would make it's a sheet that goes over the endoscope. That would make it the endoscope too wide in order to work with an instrument in the other hand. And so you just kind of learn about ways of dealing with it. We use the anti-fog basically to help prevent fogging. Smearing, I'm usually using a four by four with some. Uh, with some um, just some saline on it to kind of wipe off any blood. And then the key thing is kind of how to guide and rest your endoscope in the ear so you don't smear it as often. So what essentially you're gonna end up doing, and I'll show a few slides of this, is that you're gonna put the endoscope into the, into the ear and then you're gonna rest, once the, the tip of the endoscope's past the hair bearing area, you're gonna rest the side of the scope against the meatus and that's gonna stabilize your endoscope so it's not moving all around like a Blair Witch effect. Again, advantages, we already went through the wide angle view. Uh, we can visualize some of these hidden recesses. And then we can actually um, kind of visualize around our instruments much easier uh, with the endoscope as compared to the microscope. So the type of endoscopes, uh, you definitely want a three chip HD camera. I think unless you're living in a really underserved third world area, that's pretty much universal now for most of the endoscope cameras. If you try to do this with a one chip camera, it is really challenging. It's all red. It's very difficult to use. I've done it once and I won't do it again. Um, you want to have make sure you have an up-to-date monitor. The scopes are three millimeters in diameter. I use the 14 centimeter scopes. The, end of the nasal scopes are 18 centimeters and that's just too long and the camera ends up around your face so there's sterility issues as well and it's just more ergonomically uncomfortable. You're more likely to have shoulder issues later on. And then the angles that I use are primarily zero and 30. I have a 45 which I sometimes use. Some people think these two are interchangeable and then rarely I have a 70 screw degree scope that I use. I almost never use that in instrument at the same time because it's really dangerous and disorienting. And so um, I would be very cautious about using a 70 degree. So Brandon, one of the uh, one of the things I learned loading trucks with Teamsters Local 741 in 1981 when I was two years old uh, was uh, to get your work field closer to you. So how do you position the patient on the bed in regard to distance from the side of the bed? And I know mm -hmm. that I actually use a chair with arms on it, so mm -hmm. I stabilize my elbow, right. and then I stabilize the scope in the ear, and I still look like I have a tremor half the time. So how do you do that? So, so it's uh, scope stabilization is definitely an issue. And like you said, I always try to pull the page. I have T-Rex arms, so I have the patient. I move them over to the side of the bed that I'm working on. I elevate the, the head and back of the bed a little bit to open the neck up a little bit so the shoulder isn't is in the way. And then, like you, like you were saying, uh, Doug, I have a, a chair with arms on it, so I rest my elbow on the chair. If that isn't working, then I'll usually sometimes, if it's a bigger patient, I can rest it on the patient without hopefully jamming your elbow into them. And then the side of the endoscope is, again, once you get it past the hair bearing area, you're going to rest the side of the endoscope on the, the ear canal, essentially, and that's going to provide you some image stabilization. And again, you're always moving around to some degree, but you'll always go back to that concept of having your elbow and then the scope as kind of the fixation point so it's not moving all around. And I have a couple of stupid kind of little brief illustrations on how to do that. And these are the different chairs that are available. I tried to cut off any uh, company insignia there so you couldn't see who it's from. And then my setup, basically, at least I have your ear, you have your ear prepped out here. I take 
take a four by four gauze and put some saline on it, put the fret over here. You don't want to dump fret into the ear because it's ototoxic, um, but having a little bit on the tip of the scope is fine. And then I try to put these a little bit underneath the drapes so they don't dehydrate as much in, the, the, in your scrub text, not having to always kind of keep them, uh, keep them essentially wet. Um, OR setup, again, the screen is gonna be right in front of you essentially or just off to the right or left depending on which side you're operating on. Um, you wanna make, don't wanna make sure it's too high or too low because you'll we'll all end up with cervical spine disease anyway. We don't wanna accelerate that. Um, and then the settings, uh, again, these are, these are the old, endos old endoscope settings. Some of the newer ones, they, these menus have changed a lot. Um, but at least if you have the old one, I do it on high enhancement and peak brightness. So I think with rhinology, they do different settings. Um, again, we talked about light source. We talked about anesthesia technique and decreasing cardiac output. You know, we want to keep that light source low. Um, and so these are some of the instruments that I find pretty useful for starting these cases. I use this 7200 beaver blade. It's a really sharp round knife. We all have round knives, which I, I use the round knife to elevate, but to try to make incisions with it, it's not a knife. It's basically just an elevator. It doesn't cut. If you have thick canal skin, that's never gonna work. And this is a, the 7200 blade's really nice. It's disposable. They're not that expensive, at least from what I recall. And they're nice to make some canal incisions. And then this is called a plester knife. It's kind of a vertical round knife, essentially. And I'll use that to make my my um, kind of medial to lateral canal cuts that I'll show you on a, uh, on a quick video here. And then these are cottonoid pledgets. These are the quarter by quarter pledgets. We, so I soak them in one to 1,000 epinephrine. I do not put one in 1,000 epinephrine on the field if there's any syringes with needles on the field because you don't want to inject epinephrine into a patient at one to 1,000. You will hurt them. And so once I've done my canal injections, I will then have them open up the epi on the field and put the cottonoids in there. I cut the strings off. I have, you know, fortunately, you know, been doing this long enough in my institution. They just do it and it's never a problem. If you're just starting this in your institution, your, your OR team may have a problem with that and you may have to figure out how to negotiate. They do have radio opaque strips on them, so they will show up on an x-ray if, if you've left any behind. I've never done that. The ear is a pretty small space. It'd be pretty hard to lose one of these. I guess it's possible, but I fortunately have not run into that. Real quick, Brandon, you know, it's interesting on that. So there's two reasons it's useful. Number one, you're, you're bringing in the, the uh, one to a thousand of an effort. The other thing that you're doing is you're bringing cotton in contact, which actually is a platelet aggregator. Mm -hmm. So we use cotton in the brainstem all the time. And uh, I had a carotid artery rupture in the cranial uh, And one of our neurosurgeons walked in, took a big piece of cotton, and just set it next, just set it next to the carotid. And it stopped bleeding, and we closed the head. So uh, there's this big hullabaloo about closing cotton in the space. There's a problem with the middle ear is the middle ear is, is semi-sterile. It's, it's a mm -hmm. clean field, it's not sterile. So cotton will infect there. But um, I like the pleasure idea because you can always go back and, and see the, the, the uh, on an x-ray, you can see yeah. if you can do it. But the other way to do it is to use gel foam if it's gonna stay in there. But I'll put that one to a thousand piece of gel foam mm -hmm. I just can't get something to stop bleeding. Yeah. But I do take all of that stuff back out after. And you got to tell the anesthesia because it'll bump the blood pressure. Yeah. And then for I, some people use cotton balls. I just have never done that just because I worry about leaving it behind. But that's also quite effective. And the nice thing about using little pieces of cotton instead of the cottonoids is you can customize the size because if you have a smaller canal, even that quarter by quarter cottonoid can look huge and be a problem to manipulate around. You can just keep a tally. Like there's two right. cotton balls in. And right. The cotton ball, I'll put it back on the drain so we can adjust the better all out. And then these are a couple other useful dissectors. This is a Thomason dissector uh, named after a French surgeon who kind of initially started using this technique back in the late 80s. Um, and it's kind of a, a kind of a crab tree on steroids. The actual blade is thicker. We've all broken crab trees, or at least I've broken them. This one, it's pretty hard to break or bend. Um, but it has a nice kind of rounded, sharp, somewhat sharp edge that's great for dissecting. And there's a right and left end on either side of the instrument. I find this eminently useful for cholesteatoma dissections. And then there's a kind of a double angled one, which is nice if you're having, if you have disease kind of on the lateral semicircular canal along the tegman tympani. This is a nice tool to help um, help address those areas. And that comes right out of the, right out of the office. <laughs> what are you doing when you scrape your teeth and punch the dentist best? So this is a, a, a multi-tool that I was talking about. It's a suction round knife. So there's a number of different iterations from this. It's got a swivel end on it. So where the suction hooks up here, you're not kind of anchored to the suction and having to roll it around, roll the whole suction around. It actually kind of is attached independently. And it's got a suction tubing in it essentially. And it's really nice if you're just starting out with this technique and it allows you to elevate your flap without having to deal with a lot of blood and without necessarily having to use as many pledgets essentially. Um, actually, I'm going to skip through some of this part. And it's called a suction round knife. Suction round knife, yeah. You'll see them. We've got them here. 
Uh, oh, so surgeon positioning gun, this is kind of what Doug was talking about earlier. So on my instrument hand, I'm resting on the side of the bed here. I don't have the arm up in the right place, but sometimes it's just easier for me to rest my hand on the operative on the bed. This is a pediatric patient, so I have a little bit more room to work. And so my right hand is stabilized with the elbow on the bed, and my hand is resting on the side of the head with the endoscope. My elbow is actually resting on the bed here, and then my hand's on the endoscope, and the side of the endoscope is resting on the ear canal. So this is kind of just showing a little bit of an illustration about that, about, the, about how to rest your scope. So this is the membranous uh, ear canal, osseous ear canal, and the side of my scope is essentially going to be resting on the membranous canal. And then if I want to change my view, say if I want to look superiorly, then you're usually going to put your endoscope on the opposite portion of the canal. So if I'm looking superiorly, my endoscope is going to rest more on the inferior canal, and then if I want to look higher up or more straight ahead, I can maneuver my arm so I can change my view of where I'm at in the ear canal. So this is kind of, again, a coronal view here. You can do the same thing if I want to look in the hypotympanum. My scope is going to rest on, the side of my scope is going to rest on the superior aspect of the membranous canal, and that will allow me to address hypotympanic disease and also see the mesotympanum as I, as I move it here. So does that make sense? Kind of? Um, the same concept, again, anterior, posterior. Again, if I want to look more in the Eustachian II protempanum area, scope is going to rest on the posterior membranous canal for image stability. And likewise, if I'm looking at the retrotempanum, the scope is going to be more in front of you and your hand's going to rest, the scope's going to rest on the anterior canal wall. And then this is just a few more slides just showing kind of canal injections. When I started, I used to do my canal injections with the microscope, but it's just as easy to do with the endoscope. I try to make put this needle I put in a little bit far lateral. I try to get it maybe two or three millimeters lateral to the hair bearing skin edge or the osteocartilaginous junction. Once I get this in here, I can tunnel a little bit and then just slowly infiltrate in the usually. Sometimes I can get all the entire canal with one injection, sometimes I don't, but you can see how this nicely blanches. So the order on which I do things is I'll first clean all the serum out of the canal with a suction. I will then inject, and then the next thing I'll do is I will basically cut the ear canal hairs. And the reason why I do it in that order is that if I go ahead and inject, and I've already cut my ear canal hairs, I've not given my enough time for my local anesthetic to work, right? So. So I start with cleaning the cerumen out, then I do my injections, and then I start trimming the hairs. I just use a curved iris scissor. Yeah, you do this because, like the nose, those hairs have you know sebaceous material on them, and they kind of you know they smear the scope. And so I try to cut them as short as possible. Some of, some companies have been trying to come up with a, a more efficient way of doing this, um, and it normally takes me just a couple of minutes to do it. Essentially, sometimes if they have no ear canal hair, then you're kind of sitting there, and you just have to go ahead and start the case. So. I'd rather have that though than long ear canal hairs. So this is canal incisions. Um, this is actually, I think, a stapes case. I normally always start my incisions inferiorly because that's the most dependent portion of the ear. And so the, if I have bleeding there, if I start up superiorly and it starts bleeding, then I'm not gonna be able to see inferiorly as well. So I start inferiorly. This is that plester knife that I was talking about. This is just a standard tympanoil flap I did for a stapes case. And now I'm making incision just anterior to the malleus lateral process coming out laterally. And this is actually a regular round knife that actually is sharp and not the suction round knife. And I'm just cutting through that um, canal skin with that. The 7200 blade is actually a little bigger, so if you have thicker canal skin, it actually works better than a round knife because it is a has a larger diameter, essentially. So key thing is that when you make these incisions, the most common places for the flap to get stuck are inferiorly right here at this apex corner and superiorly. And this is the more difficult one because that you're cutting through some of the vascular strips so that tissue is much thicker. So you have to make more of an effort. And I, what I try to tell my trainees and I try to do myself is I try to cross hatch. So this incision and this incision kind of mark through each other like an X essentially. And that hopefully separates those corners so it doesn't get stuck. Same thing inferiorly, but this corner actually the skin is thinner and it's a little easier to make that separation. So now this is just a flap elevation. And so here I'm just using the round knife. I don't think I had a suction round knife here, but I start at the inferior corner just because that, that corner is easier to separate than the superior one. And I'm just lifting up here essentially and put, moving this along. And you always like, like, in, like with the microscope, you're keeping your instrument on the bone. You're not lifting off, especially as you get closer to the bony annulus. If you do that, you'll separate the squamous layer from the fibrous layer. So now we put that quarter by quarter cottonoid in here. You can kind of get a relative idea of what size it is. And you can actually elevate the flap of the cottonoid. So I'll take the cottonoid, I'll push it with the with 20 or an 18 suction right along the bone, and that will do your flap dissection. And it pushes the rest of the skin forward into on top of the tympanic membrane so it's out of your way. And this is just the round knife again. You can see the quarter tympany nerve right here, and you're in the middle ear. I find it far easier to elevate a flap 
uh, you know, through the canal with an endoscope than with a microscope. I, you know, I, I used the speculum all the time when I was doing transcanal microscopic stapy surgery, um, but it, it was just, you know, it was just me, to me frustrating. Even though I got good at it, it still was annoying. So I can elevate these flaps two to three minutes. It's pretty quick. You know, I'm probably not as fast as Doug with the microscope, but I think I'm pretty close. So. so one thing to think about is that lower incision is right by the tympanomastoid suture line, and the tympanosquamous suture line is up above. So mm -hmm. a lot of people will make their incision uh, like above the tympanosquamous suture line, and then you get into like a fist fight with this flap trying to get it up. Right. So what I do is if I, if I do that, which I screwed up about 80% of the time, I take a Bellucci scissors and cut push it. up against it and cut it, and you make the flap anterior, so in case you get a cut and you've got a flap to cover it, and we'll look at that in the lab. The other thing is you can make the incision right below the tip of the swing suture line and elevate it up. And oftentimes I'll drill that suture line away when I'm trying to get a better view in the middle ear. So it's, it's actually the suture line sometimes that really gets you. Right, because the soft tissue will get stuck in there and you have to find some way to separate it. So if you're using a round knife to do it, it won't, a lot of times won't work and you'll have to use either rosin needle to pick it out or use Bellucci or Glasscock scissors or something like that to get that tissue to separate essentially. What was that instrument you just used to do that last little bit of so the question is, what was that instrument for the flap elevation? I'm trying to remember now. Just a round I think it was just a round knife. Oh, so, that's the last instrument, the very last instrument. This guy. That's just a cup. So what I'm doing there is... Yeah, it's just a cup forcep. And so once you get this, if you want to expose the malleus neck, uh, you can use a lot of cups and alligators in this technique because you only have one hand. And so I'll grab some of that thicker kind of pars flasta tissue, and it's actually those malleolar folds, essentially, and I'll grab it and I will slowly pull it away, because there's no annulus in the notch of venus, right? So you can, that stuff will easily pull away from that area. Now, if it's a real deep, if it's a pars flasta retraction, then you really have to be much more delicate about it. But if in a normal middle ear, like a, you know, stapes, or a congenital middle ear malformation, something like that, or even a TM perf, this stuff separates quite readily. Yeah, so if you, if you look at what Brand is doing, and, and I, I just, really try to push this on the fellows is one of the things to learn today is the steady, smooth elevation of tissue, not jerking. When you jerk and that's when you really start jiggling the ossicular chain. And I always try to go in the plane if I can coming from behind. I try to go parallel with the stapedial tendon because mm -hmm. if you do jiggle the ossicular chain, the stapedial tendon is working to stabilize for you as you're lifting stuff up. But nice, steady, smooth motion is what you really need to work on. And the other thing is when you're elevating the canal skin on the superior canal down towards the notch of venous, sometimes those round knives are pretty big. And it is really easy, as Doug said, to kind of nail the lateral process of malleus and cause a lot of ossicular uh, movement. And so as you get close to that notch of venous, you really have to kind of slow down and not kind of accidentally pass point or slip and hit the malleus. So, um, so you can approach that posteriorly and not run into that problem as much, or use a rose needle to kind of finish that last little bud off. Or sometimes I'll even use a cotton one and just push that stuff out of the notch of with a cotton one, but sometimes that's too big as well, so. Um, so just a last thing, start with something easy. I mean, it seems silly to do it with a PE tube, but that at least lets you, lets you get familiar with the endoscope and how to use it, or a simple posterior perf's a great case for it. Uh, tend to course or two, you're doing that today. Start on a low volume day, don't book five ear cases with three of them being endoscopic as your first day of endoscopic. That's really, you're gonna just be stressed out, it's gonna take you longer, you're gonna, you're gonna quit early if you run into any adversity, and so start on a light, low volume day, have the microscope available when you first start, be patient, have fun, um, record your cases. I learn a lot, I've made a number of videos. Um, I learn a lot from watching my own surgery, and you can do that with the microscope or the endoscope. I think it's really helpful to go back and analyze technique, particularly if you feel like you had a really difficult case, you can go back and analyze analyze it later and figure out like what did I, why was this so difficult? What was I making and what was I, how was I making this more difficult for myself? So I think it's always helpful to video your cases and if you have an opportunity to make a video of it, you can learn a lot about your technique and how to improve it. That's it.